بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كتاب أنزلناه إليك مبارك ليتدبروا آياته وليتذكر أولو الألباب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما كان محمد أبا أحد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبيين وكان الله بكل شيء عليما يا أيها الذين آمنوا اذكروا الله ذكرا كثيرا وسبحوه بكرة وأصيلا هو الذي يصلي عليكم وملائكته ليخرجكم من الظلمات إلى النور وكان بالمؤمنين رحيما تحيتهم يوم يلقونه سلام وأعد لهم أجرا كريما يا أيها النبي إنا أرسلناك شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا وبشر المؤمنين وبشر المؤمنين بأن لهم من الله فضلا كبيرا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد آتينا داود منا فضلا يا جبال أوبي معه والطير وألنا له الحديد أن اعمل سابغات وقدر في السرد واعملوا صالحا إن بما تعملون بصير ولسليمان الريح غدوها شهر ورواحها شهر وأسلنا له عين القطر ومن الجن من يعمل بين يديه بإذن ربه ومن يزغ منهم عن أمرنا نذقه من عذاب السعير يعملون له ما يشاء من محاريب وتماثيل وجفان كالجواب وقدور الراسيات اعملوا آل داود شكرا وقليل من عبادي الشكور فلما قضينا عليه الموت ما دلهم على موته إلا دابة الأرض تأكل من سأته فلما خر تبينت الجن أن لو كانوا يعلمون الغيب ما لبثوا في العذاب المهين لقد كان لسبأ في مسكنهم آية جنتان عن يمين وشمال كلوا من رزق ربكم واشكروا له بلدة طيبة ورب غفور 
فأعرضوا فأرسلنا عليهم سيل العرم وبدلناهم بجنتيهم جنتين ذواتي أكل خمط وأثل وشيء من سدر قليل ذلك جزيناهم بما كفروا وهل نجازي إلا الكفور وجعلنا بينهم وبين القرى التي باركنا فيها قرى ظاهرة وقدرنا فيها السير سيروا فيها ليالي وأياما آمنين فقالوا ربنا باعد بين أسفارنا وظلموا أنفسهم فجعلناهم فجعلناهم أحاديث ومزقناهم كل ممزق إن في ذلك لآيات لكل صبار شكور بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم تر أن الله أنزل من السماء ماء فأخرجنا به ثمرات مختلفا ألوانها ومن الجبال جدد بيض وحمر مختلف ألوانها وغرابي بسود ومن الناس والدواب والأنعام مختلف ألوانه كذلك إنما يخشى الله من عباده العلماء إن الله عزيز غفور إن الذين يتلون كتاب الله وأقاموا الصلاة وأنفقوا مما رزقناهم وأنفقوا مما رزقناهم سرا وعلانية يرجون تجارة لن تبور ليوفيهم أجورهم ويزيدهم من فضله إنه غفور شكور والذي أوحينا إليك من الكتاب هو الحق مصدقا لما بين يديه إن الله بعباده لخبير بصير ثم أورثنا الكتاب الذين اصطفينا من عبادنا فمنهم ظالم لنفسه ومنهم مقتصد ومنهم سابق بالخيرات بإذن الله ذلك هو الفضل الكبير جنات عدن يدخلونها يحلون فيها من أساور من ذهب ولؤلؤا ولباسهم فيها حرير وقالوا الحمد لله الذي أذهب عنا الحزن إن ربنا لغفور شكور الذي أحلنا دار المقامة من فضله لا يمسنا فيها نصب ولا يمسنا فيها لغوب 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. To Allah belongs praise in the heavens and on earth and from the beginning until the end. He created the heavens and earth in six days and then over the throne did He ascend. He is the eternally besought of all and the entire creation upon Him does depend. He alone provides our sustenance and our sicknesses and wounds does He mend. He created us and then guided us, revealing to us a book that we may comprehend. And also a noble prophet from Mecca of the children of Abraham did he send. Today, inshaAllah ta'ala, we'll be doing Surah Al-Ahzab and Saba and Fatir. And we begin with Surah Al-Ahzab. Surah Al-Ahzab is a Madani Surah. It's been a while since we've done a Madani Surah. And it is a relatively mid-sized Surah, 10 pages, half a juz, 73 verses. And the reason why it is called Surah Al-Ahzab, Ahzab means the Confederate Army. It means the groups of different people that have come together for a common cause. Nothing united them internally except their opposition to Islam externally. So the Ahzab is the name given to the largest army that Arabian history had ever seen in its history up until that point in time. And the purpose of that army, over 10,000 strong from many different groups, the Quraysh were in charge, but you had Ghatafan, you had entire large segments of the Arabian Peninsula coming together so that they could get rid of Islam once and for all. And they marched on Medina. And there was no way that the Muslims could fight 10,000 people. You know, there were probably around 1,500 men uh, that were uh, in, in Medina at the time. And so they were <clears throat> besieged uh, by, for around a month. And of course, the details of, this, the details of the Battle of the Trench or the Battle of Ahzab are beyond the scope of, uh, of today's lecture. You can listen to that in the seerah. But the story or the surah was revealed because of the incident of the Ahzab and because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's victory uh, that he gave to the Muslims that is referenced explicitly in this uh, surah. And remember that uh, the Muslims were locked down for around a month internally and surrounded by the Ahzab externally. And then there was the potential, the rumors began to spread that the uh, Banu Quraida, one of the uh, local uh, tribes had defected over to the side of the Quraysh and they were going to betray from within and they were going to simultaneously launch an attack from within and the Quraysh from without and that would have really been a complete disaster but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervened and it was one of the greatest miracles that the Muslims themselves witnessed and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala references this verse number nine that Ya ayyuhalladhina O you who believe remember Allah's favors on you when the forces came and armies came to attack you and we sent a wind and we sent forces that you could not see and indeed Allah is aware of all that you do. When they came to you from above you and from beneath you, in other words from all sides, when they came to you from above you and from beneath you and the eyes became glazed and the hearts reached the throats and people began harboring evil thoughts about Allah. Look at how the Quran is describing how frightened some of the people were. People began thinking thoughts that how can Allah abandon us here? This is the hypocrites here. Then Allah says, هُنَالِكَ بَتُولِيَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ This is where the believers were tested. وَزُلْزِلُوا زِلْزَالًا شَدِيدًا And they were shaken to the very core. Imagine for over a month, the hunger, the supplies are dwindling. They don't even have food to eat. Their families are in terror. There's an internal enemy of the Banu Quraida. There's an external threat. There is going to be no other hope, no other army. They're the only Muslims in the world. What is going to happen? And the days go on and the weeks go on. And so people, the, the hypocrites began spreading uh, the fear and uh, uh, causing more chaos within the ranks of the Muslims. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then praises the Muslims as well. And he contrasts the Muslims with the hypocrites. So a lot of the story deals with the hypocrites as well. For example, Allah says about the hypocrites that Verse number 13, that قَالَ الطَّائِفَةُ مِنْهُمْ يَا أَهْلَ يَثْرِبَ لَا مُقَامَ لَكُمْ فَرْجِعُوا And when a group of the hypocrites said, O people of Yathrib, notice they're still calling it the Jahili name. Muslims should not call Medina Yathrib. But Allah is describing them in this subtle fashion that they're the old school. They want to be in the days of Jahiliyyah. O people of Yathrib, you're not going to win against this. So withdraw, so, with, so go back to your houses and flee. And a group amongst them, they tried to 
make an excuse from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they said, in buyutana awratun wa ma hiya bi awra. They said, our houses are exposed, we need to protect our wives and children. And Allah says, that wasn't the real excuse. Their houses were not exposed and they only wanted to run away. Verse number 14, and if the enemy had invaded from all sides and they were asked to abandon their faith, they would have willingly abandoned their faith. They would have embraced kufr. In other words, they're not really worried about iman and kufr to them. Life is life of this world. Iman and kufr are secondary things. It didn't really matter. When power was for Islam, they embraced Islam. And then when power began to waver, their hearts began to waver as well. No, dear brothers and sisters, truth is independent of political strength. Sometimes the Muslims are strong, sometimes they're gonna be weak. Truth is independent of that. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the vacillating nature of the uh, hypocrites. Contrast this, and by the way, a lot of verses in the surah, uh, read verses 57 to 60, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally says, What a sad state of affairs. They are accursed wherever they go. Wherever they go, they are accursed. So Allah Azza wa Jal sends his la'na on the hypocrites. Contrast this to the believers. The mu'min, those who firmly believed in the promise of Allah and in the promise of the messenger. Verse number 22, When the mu'mins saw the Confederate army, when they saw this massive crowd coming, rather than fleeing, rather than vacillating and wavering, they said, هَذَا مَا وَعَدَنَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ this is what Allah and the Messenger have promised us. Allah and, other, and they have told us the truth. وَمَا زَادَهُمْ إِلَّا إِيمَانًا وَتَسْلِيمًا And it only increased them in their faith and in their submission and certainty. When they saw the danger around them, they said, this is the test Allah promised us. And their iman in Allah went even higher. And this shows us at times of stress, at times of danger, at times of anxiety, we need to strengthen our resolve by by turning to Allah. Look at what Allah Azza wa Jal says, that their Iman went up, وَمَا زَادُهُمْ إِلَّا إِيمَانًا Their Iman went up at times of danger, that's when we need Iman the most, even though we need Iman at all times, but especially when the situation is difficult. And this is why Allah praises the believers. Verse number 23, مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رِجَالٌ صَدَقُوا مَا عَاهَدُوا اللَّهَ عَلَيْهِ There are those amongst the believers, they fulfill their promises to Allah. They promised Allah something and they fulfilled that promise. Some of them have fulfilled it completely. And this means they have been made shaheed, they, are, they have passed away. And others are still waiting and they're not going to waver. And Allah Azza wa Jal praises the believers and contrasts them to the hypocrites. Verse number 36, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَارَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ It is not befitting, it's not possible, it's not conceivable for a believing man or a believing woman. Once Allah and His Messenger have undertaken a decision, that they then choose their decision above the decision of Allah or His Messenger. And just like it applied to an explicit commandment of a political nature back then, so too it applies to an ethical or moral issue of today. Once Allah and His Messenger have decided something, you need to choose whether you're a mu'min or not. If you are a mu'min, then you must submit. If you're not a mu'min, then you make your choice and you face the consequences. It's that simple. Wama kana. Look at how Allah phrased it. It's not possible for a mu'min or a mu'mina. Once Allah and His Messenger have made a decision, that they then follow something else in that matter. Now, again, the following here is not to sin, meaning that what is being referenced here is your paradigm, your frame of mind. What is being referenced here are your ideals and your goals. It is definitely possible for the mu'min to commit a sin. But the mu'min commits a sin and he knows it is a sin. He knows deep down inside this is wrong. What Allah is saying, it is not possible for the mu'min or mu'mina to change right and wrong in their paradigm and to think that the right is wrong and the wrong is right. That is never possible. The mu'min does commit sins and then repents to Allah and asks Allah's uh, forgiveness. And so when Allah prays the believers, criticize the hypocrites, when Allah Azza wa Jal mentions that the mu'mins, the, the, the believers turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they said, Hasbun Allah. They turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verse number 25, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَكَفَ اللَّهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الْقِتَالِ What a powerful verse here. And Allah, 
took care of fighting on your behalf. Allah fought on your behalf. Allah is all powerful and almighty. Can you believe that the largest army ever gathered in the history of Arabia up until that point in time? Obviously, the Muslim armies afterwards would get bigger and bigger, but up until that point in time, it was the largest army. Can you believe the Muslims did not have a battle with that army? Allah took care of that army directly. How so? As we already ref referenced, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a thunderstorm. Imagine a hurricane in the sandstorms of the desert and the sand went everywhere and the wind took everything and they went to sleep at night with the winds howling and the Sahaba woke up and in the morning there was nowhere, no one to be seen. Subhanallah, as Allah says, I took care of the battle for you. وَكَفَ اللَّهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الْقِتَالِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ قَوِيًّا عَزِيزًا And look again, and I mentioned this a few days ago in the story of Musa, when Allah says, I threw them into the ocean. Here Allah says, I took care of them for you. SubhanAllah, the power of the Quran, the language when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks, who else can say this in such a, uh, it, it, we can call it a blase attitude if anybody else did it, but it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he has every right to say, I took care of them for you. وَكَفَ اللَّهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الْقِتَالِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ قَوِيًّا عَزِيزًا uh, one of the themes of the surah as well actually, throughout the entire surah, one of the whole uh, main themes of Surah Al-Ahzab, remember it came down in the fifth year of the Hijrah, is the status of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and also the status of his family, of his wives and the domestic issues. And there are some laws as well about the uh, personal lives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this surah comes down as well during the time of some marital tensions. Uh, between the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and our mothers. And uh, I have mentioned this story in a lot more detail in my Seerah episodes, you can listen to them there. And I mentioned over there, that truly we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He sent us a prophet that is fully human, that He sent us a prophet that had minor issues, minor you know, arguments back and forth between our mothers and Him, so that we actually have a role model. Can you imagine, can you imagine if our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa marriage, if Allah wanted to, He could have made them perfect. If Allah wanted to, there would never have been an issue. But then where would have been the role model? There is no marriage on earth except that it has has its ups and its downs. The goal, of course, is to have far more ups than downs, right? The goal is that the, the marriage is overall healthy, alhamdulillah, and that's the goal of all of us. The Prophet ﷺ as well had a few, a few downs and issues here and there, and in those there are so many lessons and wisdoms for us. And in this particular issue of Surah Al-Ahzab, uh, uh, by the fifth year of the Hijrah, obviously the economic circumstances are changing. Uh, the Muslim community is increasing in its wealth and our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now has access to a lot more wealth than he used to, obviously in Mecca or even in early Medina. And so some of our mothers, and they have every right to do this, they began to ask for a better lifestyle, a larger you know, uh, house and whatnot. They wanted to have a better lifestyle and it is human nature and it is completely permissible, dear Muslims, completely permissible for a Muslim or Muslimah to live within his or her means if the means are halal. That's all permissible. Whatever your permissible income is, you live a lifestyle in accordance with that. However, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not like any of us. He is not like any of us. He is the ultimate role model for all of humanity and it would not be befitting for the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam to live in a lavish mansion, to have, you know, servants. It would not be befitting and it would make, you know, people's tongues wag and whatnot. And what? And it's not him. It's not who he is as a human being, ascetic, simple person. So when our mothers wanted, what, and they had every right to ask. So our Prophet sallallahu alayhi felt tension and he withdrew for an entire month. He slept in the masjid. And I went over this in my Sira lectures in more detail, you can listen to this. And I mentioned there as well, by the way, that dear husbands, if you have an issue with your spouses, with your wives, if you have a problem with them, and it, sometimes it does happen that you get angry and whatnot, subhanAllah, it is the husband who leaves and the wife stays and never ever, a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah, is the wife kicked out, never husbands, 
Act like men, even in issues of dispute and anger. Be gentlemen to your wives. If there's an issue, and sometimes it happens, anger flares and whatnot, be a gentleman and you leave for a while. Never ever take an innocent woman and, and uh, put her in a circumstance that is not befitting, put her outside, never do that. This is something the man, if he gets angry, he goes sleeps in the in the uh, living room. Or worse than this, he goes to the masjid, as our Prophet Sallallahu did. He slept an entire month in the masjid. Then. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verse number 28 in the Quran. And what a beautiful verse. Ya ayyuhan nabiyyu, qul li azwajik. Say, O Prophet, to your wives, in kuntunna turidna al-hayata dunya wa zinataha. If you want this world and the beauty of this world, fata'alayn, come, I shall give you umatti'kunna wa usarrihkunna sarahan jamila. I will give you till you are happy. And then I will let you go in a beautiful manner. Look, the even, it wasn't even the word divorce was not even mentioned. It wasn't even hinted at. There was no threat of divorce. It's a simple statement. You want this dunya? You know what? Okay, fine. Here is it. I'll give you a nice gift and then you go your way and I'll go my way. But if you choose Allah and you choose the messenger of Allah, then in that case, you will get the Darul Akhirah. You will get the abode of the hereafter. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised for you, the righteous amongst you, a magnificent reward. Look what a beautiful gift gift here, verses 28, 29. You make the choice that the Prophet is not like the ordinary person. He cannot live the lifestyle that you are asking for. This is going to be his simplicity. And SubhanAllah, look at this as well. If he wanted to, he could have lived the most lavish lifestyle. Everybody would have not even blinked an eyelid. His followers, we mean the Muslims, nobody would have cared. He is the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Umar ibn Khattab was crying. It was in this incident when Ahzab came down. Umar radiallahu anhu was crying. He said, Ya Rasulullah, the emperors of Rome and Persia, look at their houses, look at their palaces and you don't even have a soft mattress to lie down on. And our Prophet ﷺ said, don't you, don't you, <clears throat> our Prophet ﷺ said that, oh Umar, do you really mind or matter that they have been given this dunya and we have been given the akhirah? SubhanAllah, this is where our Prophet Sallallahu is heading. He wants the akhirah. He's not interested in this world. Are you not satisfied, O Umar, that they have been given this world and we have been given the akhirah? So this was that incident when Umar ibn Khattar عنه, he, he, he made that, that emotional statement and Allah Azza wa then revealed this verse. Ya Rasulullah, offer your wives. They want this world, Bismillah. Or if they want the akhirah, they can stay with you. And every Every one of our mothers, they stayed with our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is when our mothers are also told, verse number 32, our mothers are also told that, Ya Nisa and Nabi, O wives of the Prophet, Lastunnaka ahad min an nisa you are not like any other lady. You're not like, you're married to somebody who is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi You cannot consider yourselves like other women. You are not like other ladies out there. So if you are pious, and of course here's the condition here, is that Allah is saying, of course you are pious. If you are pious, then do not speak in a soft tone so that the hearts of those who are evil, they might think evil thoughts, but rather speak in an appropriate manner. وَقُلْنَ قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا Subhanallah, imagine our mothers are being told, our mothers are being told that when you speak, then speak in a manner that nobody might read in something. So Subhanallah, if this is the case with our mothers, and I swear to you, any male amongst us, any male, you cannot even think, A'udhu Billah, A'udhu Billah. You think of our mother Aisha, our mother Khadija, and your heart is full of motherly, like this is our mother. Yet Allah is saying to them that when you speak to other men, then speak in a manner that is not going to cause anybody who has a disease in the heart to read in something. So if this is the paragon, if this is the paradigm, if this is the uh, standard that they have been given, then what do you think anybody else after them? And subhanAllah, it is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is is indicating that you know those men who are not fully pious, subhanAllah, they will read in anything. If a sister blinks, they're gonna think that the that lady's flirting with them. SubhanAllah, this is how some men are and I'm not justifying, I'm not justifying. I'm simply stating this is a fact that Allah Himself is indicating here that someone as righteous as our mothers, someone as a, as a group as righteous as them, that Allah is telling them, speak in a dignified manner and don't speak in a soft or in a, in a way that might bring about you know um, uh, temptations or whatnot or 
people who have a disease in their heart. And notice Allah does call that they have a disease in their heart. But there are men like this. And sometimes there are many, much percentage. So we need to monitor both sides of it. And each gender has to do its uh, job. And so Allah says to them, وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ And remain in your houses. وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَ تَبَرُّجَ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ الْأُولَى And do not display yourselves like the women of the Jahiliyyah would display themselves. Meaning in immodest uh, clothing. And Allah says, Allah wants to purify you ahl al bayti and make sure that you are purified thoroughly this verse verse 33 is explicit that ahl al bayt is inclusive of the mothers of the believers anybody who says otherwise has clearly not even read the quran with an open mind yes indeed the prophet sallallahu children are his ahl al bayt and his daughters are ahl al bayt and his grandchildren ahl al bayt but our mothers are also ahl al bayt by the text of the quran and verse 59 the Prophet is advised that Ya ayyuhan nabiyyu, O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers, tell all of them and yudnina alayhinna min jalabibihin that they should draw their cloaks over themselves. That is more appropriate so that they may be recognized, meaning as virtuous ladies and therefore not harassed. And indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. This is verse 59 of Surah Al-Ahzab. Pair this to Together with the verse we did in Surah uh, An-Nur uh, that talked about as well the issue of the khimar. These two verses are all that you need to uh, get from the Quran, the Quranic paradigm of feminine modesty. In Surah uh, An-Nur, we learned that women should cover khimar over their bosoms, which is the hair and the bosom area. And in this ayah, we are explicitly told that they should wear loose covering and loose garment, preferably a separate garment on top, but even if it's not separate, but the point is there should be something that is loose. That's the whole point of yudnina alayhinna min jalabibihin, that it should not be uh, tight. And these are the two main conditions that the entire uh, body of the womb be covered. And again, this is explicit in the Quran. And notice here, Allah is saying, ذلك أدن أن يعرفنا فلا يؤذين, so that they should not be intimidated or harassed. And again, there is no justification for any man to say or do anything inappropriate. At the same time, both genders need to do their job as well. And just like we take precautions for anything, so too we take reasonable precautions in this issue as well. And Allah is indicating here. It is an indication that is Quranic, it is not coming from me. And I know this is sensitive, but this is the Quran. And I am teaching you the Quran. If, it, if you find this problematic, then it is not my speech you are finding problematic. Keep that in mind. Allah is explicitly stating that if a person is not wearing appropriate clothing, it is more likely that they will be harassed. It is not a justification of the harassment, number one. Number two, it, there is no indication that if you wear hijab, you will not to be harassed. Of course, you can still be harassed with hijab. There are still bad people out there. Doesn't matter. But we do our job and we leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a part of reasonable precautions is we dress modestly and we act modestly and we act with decency and we dress with decency. This is very much Quranic. Now, if after all of this, somebody still does something wrong, the sin is definitely on them. And even if a person dresses immodestly, that does not in any sense fashion reform justify another person perpetrating violence or something negative. That's a sin, but that doesn't negate that the first party as well should do something as much as possible. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for iman and taqwa. And I know it's difficult in this day and age. We're all struggling in our own ways. I ask Allah azza wa to make it easy for all of us. But the point is, it is in the Quran and it is very explicit. O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and all the women of the believers. Uh, this, um, the next verse, verse 35 in the surah, it is one of the most explicit verses about gender equity in the entire Quran. I have said multiple times that it is explicit from the Quranic message that men and women are spiritually equal. In the eyes of Allah, they are equal. Their value as a human being, their value as a servant of Allah is equal and that is the real equality. Any other type of equality, it is frankly a figment of one's own imagination and it doesn't actually exist in the real world world despite what people might say in the real world psychologically emotionally genders treat each other differently even in the confines of marriage and that's a separate topic altogether my point is that 
the real equality, which is the equality that is Quranic, is spiritual equality. After this, men and women are different physically and physiologically. But spiritually, verse number 35, read this verse. إِنَّ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَالْمُسْلِمَاتِ وَالْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَالْقَانِتِينَ وَالْقَانِتَاتِ وَالصَّادِقِينَ وَالصَّادِقَاتِ وَالْخَاشِعِينَ وَالْخَاشِعَاتِ All the way to the end, believing men and women, Muslim men and women, obedient men and women, truthful men and women, patient men and women, humble men and women, charitable men and women, fasting men and women, uh, chaste men men and women, uh, the, the men and women who do dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for all of them, Allah has promised a pardon and an immense reward. So this ayah, verse 35 of Surah Al-Ahzab is one of the most important verses about gender equity. Also, this surah came down with the issue of the marriage of Zainab bint Jahsh. This is verse number uh, 37. Uh, and this is one of the stories of the seerah that I cannot go over over here. It's a very long story, uh, but it is uh, one of the verses Aisha radiallahu anha said, radiallahu anha, she said, if our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were to have hidden anything from the Quran, it would have been this verse. The fact that it is in the Quran demonstrates that the Quran is not from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is conveying it as it has been conveyed to him. And of course, the story is the story of the marriage of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with Zainab. And Zainab uh, was married uh, to his um, uh, the person whom he had taken as a son, uh, announced that he was his son, and that is Zayd ibn Haritha. And this surah came down to annul the concept of this type of, uh, of sonship, in Arabic it's called tabanni. And Zayd ibn Haritha was taken as a son, and this was an Arabian custom, an ancient custom, that if you really like somebody, and you wanted to him to be a part of your family, you had the option of a free upgrade. You had the option of saying, okay, this person, he is my son. And so uh, the Prophet Sassam, in the days of Jahiliyyah, uh, he had taken this young lad Zaid. He was of course Khadija's gift at the time of marriage as a slave. He freed him and then he loved him so much, he made him into a son. And so Zaid was called Zaid ibn Muhammad for the longest time. Then Allah reveals Surah Al-Ahzab verse four, that وَمَا جَعَلَ أَدْعِيَاءَكُمْ أَبْنَاءَكُمْ he did not make your tabanni sons into your actual sons. And verse number five, call them by their fathers. Don't call them, you know, by anybody else. Every child should be the son of whoever his father was. That is more just in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by the way, whoever translated these concepts back in the 60s or 70s, they made a very egregious error of saying that Islam forbids adoption. And because of this, untold misunderstandings and misconceptions have spread. And I sometimes want to scream in frustration, Islam encourages adoption in the standard sense of taking somebody's child and raising it and loving it like your own and giving its amenities like your own. What is haram is one aspect which by and large is not done in the Western world or even in the modern world. And that is the claim that this child is your biological child. That's not done anymore. It's a gone thing. So we should stop saying that Islam uh, does not allow adoption. Islam encourages to the highest degree, you taking an orphan child or you taking an abandoned child, somebody has abandoned the child. Islam encourages this to the highest degree. Your Jannah is promised. You're being saved from Jahannam. Our Prophet ﷺ said that myself and the one who takes care of an orphan is like this in Jannah. This is what we should be preaching. We should never say that Islam does not allow adoption because people have a misunderstanding. Islam does not allow tabanni. And tabanni is to claim that a child is your own. That is what is not allowed. So this ayah came down. And so Zayd began to be called Zayd ibn Haditha. And Allah Azza wa Jalla also revealed in this surah, that Zayd and of course Zainab were having issues and Zayd eventually divorced uh, Zainab. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after the idda had finished, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse, verse number 37, that once Zayd had finished with her, meaning the idda has been finished, zawajanakaha, that we have married you to her. So the contract between our Prophet and Zainab, it is in the Quran. There was no actual ceremony done because it is in the Quran. And you can look up the details of this in my uh, seerah or any other book of seerah about this uh, issue. Uh, this, this surah as well, 
It has the sub motif. We talked about the family of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for personal issues. It also has the status of our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Many verses about his status and about obedience to him. For example, verse forty, that ma kana Muhammadun aba ahadim min rijalikum walakin Rasul Allah wa khatam al nabiyin. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not the father of any of your men. You know the Arabs would think that a person who doesn't have a son there's something wrong with him. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took that negative and he converted it into a positive. And he said, so what if he doesn't have sons? He's not going to have sons that live to adulthood. He did have sons who passed away in childhood. And that's why Allah says, he is not the father of any of your men. He did not save any of your boys because he did have boys, but he would never have men as sons, uh, meaning they didn't grow up. وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ Allah, But he is better than this. He is Rasul Allah and he is the seal of the prophets. Khatam al nabiyin and indeed Allah is aware of everything. And then verses 41 onwards is a very oft recited verses in the salah that Ya Iwaladin Amarudkullah Dikran Kathira was Sabbihu Bukratan wa Asila, Hua Ladi Yusali Alaikum Wamalaikatu Hul Yukrijakum al Dulumati La Nur, Wakana Bil Mu'minin Rahima, Tahiyatuhum Yawma Yal Kawnahu Salam, Wa Adalahum Ajran Karima. That glorify him, praise him morning and evening. He is the one who reaches out to you, him and his angels to bring you out of the darkness and into the light. And he is ever merciful towards the believers. The day that they shall meet Allah, Allah will say salam to them. May Allah make us amongst those whom he says salam to. And he has prepared for them a generous reward. Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, O Prophet, inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadheera wa da'iyan ila Allah bi'idhnihi wa sirajan munira. Look at how many descriptions are over here that O Messenger, we have sent you as a witness, as a bear of good news as a warner, as a caller by the permission of Allah and as an illuminating light and give the believers the good news that for them there is a great reward. And of course, in Surah Al-Ahzab, you have that one verse that is recited in every single khutbah and it is recited in every single lecture and it is acted upon by billions and billions of people every single day so many times. Verse number 56, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما. Oh, you who believe that, that uh, Allah is saying that Allah and the angels they send their blessings upon the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Oh, you who believe you as well send blessings upon him and greet him with the prayers of peace. So we send our salat and our salam upon the one whom Allah and the angels also send their salat and their salam upon. And I have given a khutbah about uh, the concept of salat and salam and what does it mean and what is the difference between our salam and the angel salam and Allah salam and that is a longer topic that you can uh, look up and the surah concludes by bringing us back to the day of judgment and uh, telling them, uh, telling the people that no one knows the day of judgment except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Allah, that on the day of judgment there will be people that they will say to uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inna ta'na sadatana wa kubra'ana wa dhalluna sabila that oh Allah, we followed these leaders and these noblemen that we consider to be right, they're the ones who led us astray. That Rabbana atihim dhu'fayni min al-adhabi that oh, oh, oh our Lord, give them the double punishment and send extra la'na upon them. So once again, we get to this issue of who do you look up to? Who do you really look up to? Who are your role models? Because over and over again, the Quran is saying, if you have bad role models, they will lead you astray. And then the surah concludes with a very, very powerful verse that so much commentary has been given on. And uh, it is about the issue of Allah saying that, inna aradna al-amanata ala samawati wal ardi wal jibal that we uh, gave the option of the amana. And amana here is the trust. We gave this trust to the heavens and to the earth and to the mountains. And all of them said, we don't want this amana. And man said, we'll take it. And Allah says, man was foolish. Dhaluman here should be translated as foolish. And uh, jahula, yani he made it yani, towards the, the rights of Allah Azza wa Jal, that he didn't live up to the rights of Allah. And this, what does it mean that the amana was given to uh, all of the creation and they all turned it down and man said, we will take it. There's a lot of interpretation in the classical books, but in, the, in a nutshell, what this means is that the issue of 
taklif or legal responsibility, the issue of us being the, 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 the leader of the creation, that we are the highest in the hierarchy, the issue of the revelation coming to us, of halal and haram being sent upon us, of the prophets being sent to us, the whole issue of us being cognizant and aware, the issue of us having been given all of these blessings, that it was a blessing, it's an amana, and an amana here, that just like we have been gifted something, well then, we will have to then make sure we fulfill our obligations. And so the uh, some of the books of Tafsir say that the heavens and the earth and the creation, every other entity was asked that, look, if you want, I can make you, give you this position. And if you are pious, you shall get Jannah. And if you are not pious, well then it's the other place. So there's a lot of privilege in this world and with privilege, the potential to go to Jannah, but also the dangers of going to Jahannam. That is the amana. And all of the creation said, you know what? We'd rather just be the creation and just, you know, uh, exist and then non-exist because you know the, the 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 other creations the rocks the stones the trees are not going to be transferred to jannah or jahannam they're just going to live and then that's it so they said that's good enough for us and man agreed it was a voluntary thing we, we don't remember this we don't know this but all of us were offered this adam our father and all of us were offered and we happily agreed to this and then here we are and now allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then tell us it is your responsibility so now live up to that responsibility and that's a very deep verse with obviously a lot of theological implications which are beyond the scope of today's lecture so we move on now the next verse we're gonna, the next chapter we're gonna do is Surah Saba. And Surah Saba is a Makkan Surah, mid Makkan Surah, probably the sixth to seventh year of the da'wah. And it's a smaller Surah than Ahzab, seven pages, and it is uh, 54 verses. And the main theme, or one of the main themes of Surah Saba is the power of Allah via proving the resurrection. So keep this point in mind as you read this surah. And the Saba, in English we call it Sheba, the Queen of Sheba or Sheba, Saba. Uh, Saba is a land or a province in the country of Yemen. It is one of the provinces of Yemen. Its main city was and remains Ma'rib, which is a famous city in Yemen. And uh, the civilization of Sheba, uh, by the way, the Bilqis was the queen of Sheba. And so Saba is the dynasty of the queen of Sheba, which we talked about when we did the story of Sulaiman. And the dynasty uh, or the queen of Sheba or the civilization of Sheba, it was the greatest civilization of that time frame. And we were talking about maybe around 2000 BC or so. So this is after the time of Sulaiman, uh, by a few generations, Allah is mentioning this, uh, this incident of Saba. And they lived in the city of Ma'rab, and there was a massive uh, lake or a massive uh, body of water, and they were one of the first civilizations to construct a dam to block that water and to utilize that water that would come. And they built a magnificent city that lasted many generations at the base of the dam. You can see where this is going to go. And so the dam burst in a very famous historic incident uh, when uh, a rain fell in a particular wet, wet season. Sayl al-Arimi it is called, it is a historic incident and it is referenced in the Quran. So Allah says, we sent the Sayl al-Arimi, it's in the Quran here. So it didn't just happen by fluke, nothing happens by fluke, dear Muslims. Anything that is happening, there is Allah's qadr. Keep that in mind when you look at what's happening right now. There is a wisdom, there is a reason. So Allah is saying, we are the ones who sent Sayyid al-Arim as we're going to come to. So this is the uh, background of the surah. And surah Saba begins with, Alhamdulillah, that Allah Azza wa Jal begins with Alhamdulillah. And by the way, quick quiz question here to my uh, tweeting family. Uh, mashallah, we have a great uh, time on Twitter. For those of you still not too late to join, by the way. So a quiz question here, how many surahs begin with Alhamdulillah? And what is common about all of those surahs? So list the surahs and then tell me what is common uh, in the uh, tweets. And remember the hashtag is YQ uh, gem. So let's see who can get that answer without any cheating. Look up the Quran, you're, you're gonna cheat with the Quran, don't Google the answer, dear brothers and sisters, that's besides the point. It's the month of Ramadan, it's the Quran exam, you open up the Quran, it's an open book exam, but don't Google the answer, So, Billah. Uh, so, Surah Saba. Surah Saba, as we said, it discusses um, the reality of resurrection and also the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verse number three, those who disbelieve say, when will the judgment day come? Respond to them that, Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows it will come upon you. He is the knower of the unseen. Verse number seven, those who disbelieve said, 
Should we point to you a man, meaning the Prophet ﷺ, who's going to tell you this preposterous myth that إِذَا مُزِّقْتُمْ كُلَّ مُمَزِّقٍ If you are shred into bits, you will then be resurrected again? Did he invent a lie against Allah or is there a madness in him? Then Allah says, indeed, those who do not believe in the hereafter are in torment and far astray. Don't they reflect upon what lies in front of them? Don't they see of the heavens and earth? Again, throughout the entire Quran, Allah links the power of the world around us with the reality of judgment day and resurrection. The surah then moves on to mention the blessings given to Dawood and Sulaiman, that Dawood could make the iron soft. And uh, Sulaiman had the control of the wind and the workers of the jinn, verse number 13, that they would make for him whatever he wished of sanctuaries and mosques and statues and bowls like pools and massive heavy cauldrons. The jinns would work uh, because he, Allah gave Sulaiman the power to control them. Then Allah says, اِعْمَلُوا آلَ دَاوُودَ شُكْرًا O family of Dawood, Dawood and Sulaiman, O family of Dawood, do your shukr through your amal. This is a very important verse here. Shukr is not just done by thanks. You say, Alhamdulillah, Ashukrillah. That is a part of shukr. It needs to be done. But the real shukr is in this verse. I'malu, show me your thankfulness in your actions. Do your lifestyles conform to the level of thankfulness you should have? Do your rituals, does your ibadah, does your worship, does that conform? So the real thankfulness is in one's amal and not just in tongue servants. I'malu, ala Dawood, shukra. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, but few of my servants are truly thankful. Then Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us the story of the death of Sulaiman. And this is the only time it occurs in the Quran. Verse 14, فَلَمَّا قَضَيْنَ عَلَيْهِ الْمَوْتَ When we decreed that death would come for him, nothing indicated to the jinn that Sulaiman had died. He was standing there on his staff, looking at the jinn, working for a long period of time, maybe even days went by, and he's just standing there. And uh, the jinn thought that he's monitoring them. And the earthworm, uh, the worm came, right? Some termites came and they started eating. And it took many days until finally the termites ate the staff and Sulaiman fell down dead. And so the people knew that أن الجن لو كانوا يعلمون الغيبة ما لبثوا في العذاب المهين. Jinns are not powerful. Allah is powerful. The jinns did not even know that the person in front of them was dead. That's how they are. We really have to reconfigure. And I've given many lectures about the jinn. And this verse is very clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting the jinn in their place. They didn't even know that this person who is standing there is now a corpse. And they kept on working for days on end thinking that Sulaiman is still monitoring them. And so Allah Azza wa Jal did this on purpose to show the other people who could see the jinn at that time because Sulaiman controlled them, that to show the other people that the jinn are not entities that are all knowledgeable, all powerful, they are creation. They have different characteristics than us, but the one who truly understands those characteristics does not fear them at all in a supernatural manner whatsoever. And this is something I have spoken about in my number of lectures on the jinn that I have given. Um, so. In the story as well, as we said, the story of Saba is uh, mentioned and the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them of gardens and of safety and of roads that they would travel with plenty of towns. But Allah says in verse number 17, 18, 19 and onwards, Allah says they turned away, they were ungrateful, they demanded more for the sake of boasting. They wanted to boast to people that give us even longer roads so that we can show mankind who we are. See, if Allah blesses you, it should come with humility. No problem. If Allah gives you more, you thank Allah more. No problem. The blessings of Allah are blessings if you are humble. But the minute that you become arrogant and boastful, those blessings become curses. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, again, look at the power of the Quran. How powerful this mighty civilization, the mightiest civilization of its time frame. Their structures, by the way, are still around for us to see. We still have the remnants of that massive dam that they built 3,000 something years ago, I think yeah, 3,000 years ago. And Allah says two words, فَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَحَادِيثًا We made them 
stories. Subhanallah, what power, what language in the Quran is this? Only Allah can speak like this. We made them stories and they are indeed nothing but stories for us. فَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَحَادِيثًا وَمَزَّقْنَاهُمْ كُلَّ مُمَزَّقْ And we tore them up in every single uh, tearing. And the surah then goes on to tell us of the battle between the followers and between evil leaders. Again, the same thing of Ahzab, we see it over here, each one blaming the other. Look at verse 32 and onwards, read it and ask yourselves, do you want to be in this ridiculous battle of the, the blame game? Of what use is it? Too late. You didn't think in this world what you wanted. So don't be amongst those groups of people. And then this surah ends with a beautiful challenge. Beautiful challenge. Verse 46. قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَعِذُكُمْ بِوَاحِدًا I'm asking you only one thing. This is a demand I have from you. أَن تَقُومُوا لِلَّهِ مَثْنَى وَفُرَادًا That you stand up for the sake of Allah, individually or in groups, and then you think, you ponder. Think about this person. Is he true or not? Think about the message. Think about the religion. The point of this verse is, we are being told to challenge the non-Muslims around us. That look, all I'm asking for you to do is to think reasonably. Think in groups or in individually, but ponder, look at my message, my message here, meaning the message of the Prophet ﷺ. Look at the message of Islam, look at the Quran, ask yourselves, is this true or not? That's all I'm asking. All I'm asking for is a reasonable, sincere look, and taqumu lillah, that you sincerely stand up for Allah, for truth, and then you think about the message of this man. What a reasonable religion, what more do you want? All we're asking mankind is that we want you to look at our message, look at what the Quran says, look at the life of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then you decide and what you decide you have to bear the consequences for. So this is the Surah al Saba uh, to conclude is Surah Al-Fatir today. And Surah Fatir is also a Makki Surah. And this too is one of my favorite Surahs. And I'm kidding you not, this is one of my favorite Surahs. I mean, Alhamdulillah, I have lots of favorite Surahs. And especially Surah Fatir, it has a soft spot for me. When I lead Salah, a lot of times I'll be reciting uh, from uh, Surah uh, Fatir. Uh, surah Fatir is a uh, mid-Makki Surah. It's a relatively short Surah, five and a half, six pages. And it's uh, around 45 verses. And its primary message is the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the listing of some of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, I find Surah Fatir uh, to be uh, symptomatic of the beauty of the Quran in that if you read it and you try to break it down topic wise, the topics go all over the place. The topics really are everywhere. Yet when you actually read it, the style just flows smoothly as if there is no discontinuity. This is one of the beauties of the Quran, one of the characteristics of the Quran, that human speech, it is a logical flow, A, then B, then C, then D. As for the speech of Allah, it really is just everywhere at once. And when you're reading it in Arabic, you don't even know Notice that it is going everywhere. It's just beautiful, the style and the language. This truly is a divine speech. And that's why the Quran, if you really want to appreciate it, it must be done in the Arabic language. But nonetheless, if not, then you do what you can. And listen to Surah Fatir. By the way, one of my favorite, Shaykh Muhammad Ayyub, the Qari Imam of Medina. Uh, I used to pray behind him uh, in Medina. Uh, listen to his Taraweeh recitation when he's doing it live, uh, Surah Fatir. Beautiful, beautiful Surah. Uh, but the beginning, uh, all praise is due to Allah, the originator of the heavens and earth, the one who has made angels his messengers. Some he has given two wings, some he has given three, some he has given four, and he increases as much as he wants. Jibreel alayhi salam has over 600 wings. So Allah is telling us that the angels have wings in this surah. Surah Fatir has so many amazing phrases and powerful languages. Verse number two, Whatever mercy Allah Azza wa Jal gives upon the people, none can withhold that mercy. And whatever Allah withholds, none can release it. Verse number five, O mankind, the promise of Allah is true. So do not be deceived by this world, nor let the grand deceiver, meaning shaitan, deceive you about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verse number six, مَنْ كَانَ يُرِيدُ الْعِزَّةَ فَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ جَمِيعًا Whoever desires glory, let him know that all glory belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verse number 14, those whom you call out to besides Allah, they can't even hear you. Even if they could hear you, they wouldn't have the power to to give you what you want. And on the day of judgment, they will reject your shirk. They will do kufr of your shirk. Verse number 15, O mankind, you are the fuqara to Allah, and Allah is the ghani, the all rich and the kareem. Verse number 28, 
The only servants of Allah who truly fear Allah are the ulama, the scholars. As I said, try to be at least associated with uh, the ulama, even if you're not going to be an alim, at least associate with them. And Allah Azza wa Jal says that that category of people, they can reach a level of khashyah. May Allah make all of us amongst them that no other category can reach. One of the key passages of this surah, is uh, the, 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 the story or the issue of the Qur'an having been inherited by Allah's chosen servants. Verses 32 to 33 and 34, read this section here. Then we cause to inherit the book to those whom we chose from our servants. So the, those who took the book, believe in the Qur'an, they have a certain privilege and status. But then Allah says, there's three categories amongst them. We're gonna come back to these three categories again and again in Surah Al-Rahman and in Surah Al-Waqi'ah. These three categories will be mentioned. So memorize these three categories. Here they are mentioned over here. Number one, Some of them are doing wrong to themselves. Number two, Some are mediocre, some are average. Number three, Some are racing ahead with good deeds, and that is the real blessing. You have Muslims that are not doing what they're supposed to do. You have Muslims that are just barely getting by. And then you have Muslims that are, mashallah, tabarakallah, racing and winning the race. And then verse number 33, a blessing to all three of them. Eventually, all three shall enter paradise, but each one in accordance with his or her deeds. And some of them we seek Allah's refuge might enter paradise after Jahannam, as I've explained in other uh, lectures. And what will they say, verse 34? What will they say in uh, verse, and when they get to Jannah? When they get to Jannah, وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي أَذْهَبَ عَنَّا الْحَزَنِ إِنَّ رَبَّنَا لَغَفُورٌ شَكُورٌ أَلَّذِي أَحَلَّنَا دَارَ الْمُقَامَةِ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ لَا يَمَسُّنَا فِيهَا نَصَبٌ وَلَا يَمَسُّنَا فِيهَا لُغُوبٌ They will say Alhamdulillah, who has the one who has finally gotten rid of all of our anxieties, the one that has allowed us to be in this abode of permanency, neither will we ever get tired here, nor will any vain talk or wastefulness ever afflict us. When they get to Jannah, that is when they're gonna say, Alhamdulillah, no more worries. This world, dear Muslim, it is a world of anxiety and worry. I swear to you, no one in this whole world is without worry. Doesn't matter what you have or don't have. True, the size of the worry, the quality of the worry is gonna vary from time to person to place, but every one of us has something we're anxious about, something that we're worried about. This world is associated with worry. Where will worry cease to exist? When we enter with our first step into Jannah, what will we say? Alhamdulillah alladhi adhhaba anna al-hazan. That's the goal that I have. That's the goal you should have as well. We want to enter that place which is worry-free zone. That is what Jannah is. No anxiety, no stress, no grief, no bickering, nothing of evil is going to be hap happening over there. And then the surah ends by reminding us that those who hatch evil plots, they will only ha end up harming themselves. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then gives us the stark reality of how merciful He is in the very final verse, verse 45. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, were to punish the people for what they have done, He would not leave a single creature on this entire earth. If Allah were to treat us the way way we deserve rather than the way that He wants to treat us. If Allah were to treat us without His mercy, not a single creature would be left. If we wanted that type of justice, we would not be around. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending His mercy, overlooking our mistakes, granting us reprieve and time. And then in the end, as Allah says, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ My rahmah encompasses everything. And so that is what our goal is, dear brothers and sisters. We want to have that rahmah in this world and in the next world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our fasts are accepted, our qiyam is accepted, the final 10 nights are upon us, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that in these 10 nights, especially in the odd 21, 23, 25, 27, 29. Make sure that we spend extra time in the ibadah of Allah, in the dhikr of Allah, making dua to Allah for the best of this world and the best of the next world. Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. حول خليله
صوحا وريحانا